In tonight's headlines, first at nine, nomination window shuts. First phase of nomination submissions end. SLPP rejected at six bodies while SLFP faces the same fate twice. Easing pressure. Prime Minister's office to introduce a budget pack of essential items for the festive season. Crisis of confidence. Trade unions of national carrier expressed lack of faith in management. The chairman, however, brushes it aside. Speeding to the top. Sri Lanka's champion motor racer Delanta Malagamu plans to win the World Championship next year. The Jerusalem Saga, leaders of 57 Muslim nations, gang up on the US, calling on the world to recognize East Jerusalem as Palestine's capital. Good evening, bringing you news and developments from across Sri Lanka and around the world. I'm Indiva Yamwatha on Other Derana 24-7. The window for submission of nominations for the upcoming elections in 93 local government bodies closed at noon today. However, six nominations submitted by the Sri Lanka Pudujana Peramuna and two by the Sri Lanka Freedom Party were rejected. Submission of nominations for the looming elections in 93 local government bodies commenced on Monday this week and came to a close at noon today. Following its conclusion, a window of one and a half hours was given to submit objections. During the period, six nomination papers by the Sri Lanka Podujana Peramana were rejected. The nomination paper submitted to the Maharagama Urban Council was rejected following an issue related to women's representation. We rejected the nomination because the requirement for women's representation wasn't fulfilled. The affected party can challenge it in court if necessary. Nomination papers submitted to the Badulla and Mahayangana Pradesh Sabhas in the Badulla district were also rejected. One reason for the nominations to be rejected is that requirement of the women's representation wasn't met. The other being the candidate's name not being written although the signature was there. Undue certification of nomination papers by the SLPP also led nominations of Agalavatta Pradesh Sabha and Paladura Urban Council in Kaluthara district being rejected. Meanwhile, the nomination paper submitted to the Valigama Urban Council in Mathur district was rejected because it was not submitted by an authoritative official. National organizer of the SLPP, Basil Rajapaksha, expressed his views to other Derana regarding the rejection of the party's nominations. Unfortunately, today some of our nomination papers were rejected. Our legal team, led by Professor G.L. Piris, who is uh, our chairman, will be consulting the rest of the legal team and we might get some remedies because this is the only party who is not in the government and the people who want to reject the work of this government have to have some choice. Meanwhile, the nomination papers submitted by the SLFP for Padi Talava and Dehi Atakandi Pradesh Sabhas in Ampar district were rejected. The United National Party submitted its nominations for the Dehiwala Mount Lavinia Municipal Council today. Parliamentarian Hirunika Premachandra also participated in the occasion. The UMP will surely win the Dehivala Municipal Council. Our challenge is to secure the win in Bratmalana and we'd be able to do it with the help of the public. The Sri Lanka Podujana Peramuna submitted nominations for five local government bodies in the Gampa district under the patronage of Parliamentarian Prasanna Ranutunga. There's no need to take what he says seriously because he is an unsuccessful minister. Look what he did to sports. Meanwhile, it was under the patronage of Deputy Minister Lasanta Aligiyavanna that SLFP submitted nominations for the Biagama Pradesh Sabha today. You should ask that question from the ones who divided the party. Before submitting UNP nominations for Mathur district, Ministers Mangala Samarvira and Sagal Ratnayaka, as well as Parliamentarian Buddhika Patarana, engaged in religious observances in Mathura. Candidates of the Sri Lanka Podujana Peramuna from the Mathur district also engaged in religious observances before submitting their nominations today. Can we allow the unity government which destroyed the country to destroy our villages as well? Please ask that question from your hearts. 
Meanwhile, SLFP or Sri Lanka Pudujana Peramuna did not submit nominations for the Bandaravela Urban Council today. Instead, an independent political group submitted their nominations to the Urban Council. It was under the patronage of Minister Mahinda Maravira that SLFP submitted nominations for the local government bodies in the Hambantara district. <laughs> First of all, there is a moral issue here when one serves another party while being in the SLFP. Our Central Working Committee will make a decision about those who carry out election processes in such a manner. Meanwhile, a number of views were voiced today across the political arena on the rejection of nominations. In the case of the Panadur Urban Council, the General Secretary had signed the nomination paper without mentioning a date. In the case of the Agalavatta Pradeshya Sabha, the date was set for the 17th of December. You can readily understand the disorder in Professor G. L. Pires's party. This party can't even fill an application properly. Can we put an urban council or a country in their hands? The defeat of the SLPP in Badulla began today. The first election result is released. The gods themselves have punished those who try to break up the party. Meanwhile, the joint opposition had this to say on local government elections. The number of electoral wards is low, but demand is infinite and the competition is intense. Consisting of 20 parties, ours is the biggest alliance. Not a single party was able to get through with all of their candidates. All parties have been hurt, more or less. However, when the three main parties go begging for candidates, the flower bud attracts everybody. The best way for the people to convey their disillusionment to the government is to convert their anger into a vote for the SLPP. <laughs> And now we take a look at how nominations were submitted throughout the day by political party representatives. The United National Party submitted its nominations for the Dehivala Mount Lavinia Municipal Council today. Parliamentarian Hirunika Premachandra also participated in the occasion. The UMP will surely win the Dehivala Municipal Council. Our challenge is to secure the win in Ratmalana and we'd be able to do it with the help of the public. The Sri Lanka Podhujana Peramuna submitted nominations for five local government bodies in the Gampa district under the patronage of parliamentarian Prasanna Ranutunga. There's no need to take what he says seriously because he is an unsuccessful minister. Look what he did to sports. Meanwhile, it was under the patronage of Deputy Minister Lasanta Alagiyavanna that SLFP submitted nominations for the Biagama Pradeshya Sabha today. You should ask that question from the ones who divided the party. Before submitting UNP nominations for Mathra district, Ministers Mangala Samarvira and Sagal Ratnaika, as well as parliamentarian Buddhika Patarana, engaged in religious observances in Mathra. Candidates of the Sri Lanka Podhujana Peramuna from the Mathra district also engaged in religious observances before submitting their nominations today. Can we allow the unity government which destroyed the country to destroy our villages as well? Please ask that question from your hearts. Meanwhile, SLFP or Sri Lanka Podhujana Peramuna did not submit nominations for the Bandaravela Urban Council today. Instead, an independent political group submitted their nominations to the Urban Council. It was under the patronage of Minister Mahinda Maravira that SLFP submitted nominations for the local government bodies in the Hambantara district. First of all, there is a moral issue here when one serves another party while being in the SLFP. Our Central Working Committee will make a decision about those who carry out election processes in such a manner. Former President Mahindra Rajapaksa alleges that although the SLFP group in the government levels various criticism against the UNP, they serve in the same cabinet and cooperate in all matters necessary to keep the coalition government afloat. The former head of state delivered his views in a media release today. 
Highlighting the political relationship between the UNP and the SLFP, former President Mahindra Rajapaksha alleges that the SLFP ministers vote for a UNP budget each year. The former president also claims the two parties are focused on selling off national assets. He alleges that the president appointed an SLFP member to the ministerial position of ports and shipping when the UNP minister who held the post previously objected to push through the unfavourable Hamad report deal entered into by the UNP. The former president also touched on the proposed constitution. He says that the proposed constitution will divide the country into nine semi-independent federal states while pointing out that the SLFP arm of the government only opposes the abolishment of the executive presidency and not the proposed EDCA agreement with India. Former President Rajapaksha then touched on the local government election, claiming that the SLFP and the UNP worked together to avoid holding the elections. He highlights, as per the changes made to the 19th Amendment, the term of the incumbent president will end on the 9th of January 2020. Furthermore, he says that as per the constitution, a presidential election should be held not more than two months and not less than one month before the incumbent president's term of office expires. This, the former president points out, will mean the next presidential election having to be held between the 9th of November and the 9th of December in 2019, leaving only a span of 18 months between the upcoming local government election and beginning of the next presidential election process. He also pins the upcoming local government election as the first in a series of elections to be held in the coming few years. Meanwhile, there was no getting away from the topic of beckoning local government elections for former President Rajapaksha as he was quizzed on the subject by media following an event held at the Ganga Rame Temple in Colombo today. It's only several from Vimal Viravansa's group from the joint opposition who went to SLFP. That's not it. We work as a team in the joint opposition. Sometimes Basil Rajapaksha adds his viewpoints when required. Attorney at law Maitri Gunaratna describes the new electoral system as unique and hopes all would participate in electing the right candidate to represent them. Addressing a media briefing of the Anti-Corruption Front in Colombo today, he stressed that a difference could be made to the quality of candidates if people were better educated and on the new system. This is an election system which is limited to a ward and a ward consists of only 1,000 houses or 1,000 families. In the previous system, you vote, you don't know who your representative is, and ultimately you only see him at the next election. But the new system has brought in a situation where people of the village will contest, and you have a choice of electing them irrespective of their politics. If the people were more educated about the new system and how you can elect your candidate, we would have been able to make a major change in the quality of the candidate. Therefore, we think that this is a very unique system and we hope that all people will participate in appointing the correct candidate. Also in our top story tonight, the Alliance of Unions of Sri Lankan Airlines in a letter addressed to its chairman claims that they have no confidence in both him and the board to be in charge of the national carrier. They cite the board's incompetency in managing outstanding debt and the restructuring process of the airline as cause for the situation. Rejecting allegations, however, Chairman of Sri Lankan Airlines Ajit Dias said that the restructuring process will continue and the national carrier will not be closed. The letter reads that the board chaired by Ajit Dias was appointed by the government of Sri Lanka nearly three years ago to ameliorate projected financial decline and rectify many malpractices and misappropriations allegedly committed by their predecessors. However, unions state that the board, together with the chairman, had dismissed any such alleged malpractices as nothing but reports based on hearsay, and therefore it could be reasonably assumed that the only burden taken over by the board was the accumulated debt, but with a free hand to turn around the fortunes of the airline. They added that the communique issued by the airline recently serves as a reminder that the board does not have the prerequisite competencies or the attributes to manage the airline or bring stability. Commenting on the restructuring process, the unions noted that that it would have been more prudent to have hired a competent person locally or internationally from the inception and they had observed that the task was beyond the competency of the chairman, the board and specifically the current CEO. 
they request that should any restructuring process be formulated, they must take into consideration and include the opinions of the employee bodies, thereby maintaining transparency to the employees as well as the nation. Furthermore, the unions highlighted that should the CEO or any one of the board members are retained and remains a constituent of the management of the company after the restructuring process, they have no confidence in or trust that the said process will be effective and yield the desired results. Speaking to other Derna, chairman of the Sri Lanka Airlines refuted allegations made by the six trade unions in its letter, which was copied to the president, prime minister and relevant ministries. The main problem we have is we have an inherited debt of about $700 million. The interest cost on that is about 55 to $60 million a year. If that is sorted out, the rest of it is no issue. We have sorted all those problems of corruption, abuse of power. We have reached a stage now where the government wants us to seriously look at a restructuring plan. We, I informed all the unions what the plan is. The message at this time is very strange because it was only a few days ago that all these unions promised all the cooperation possible. We can't restructure this airline unless the people inside and us and the restructuring committee get together and work. I have never said that the jobs of 7,000 people are to be terminated. What we have said is there are three options. One is to restructure the airline as it is. The second one is to restructure it in such a way that a foreign party can come and take it. And if both cannot be done, then government will have to look at options of what to do next that might include possible termination. But that is not anything close to what we are thinking of. We are definitely going to resuscitate this airline because it is not possible for the government to keep on funding this airline anymore. Also making news tonight, the Prime Minister's office announced that a budget pack of concessions for eight essential commodities will be introduced to the market, aimed at easing the cost of living during the festive season. In a statement, the Prime Minister's office said today that the decision was made during a special discussion held at Temple Trees on Tuesday under the patronage of Premier Anil Wickremesinghe. The government has taken these steps with the objective of providing the public with essential food items at concessionary rates, despite high prices prevailing in the market. Accordingly, as a measure to ease the cost of living, a budget pack including rice, lentils, sugar, sprats, onions, potatoes and canned fish will be introduced. A mechanism will be created for the distribution of budget packs through Lanka Satos outlets and private supermarket networks. The government also decided to establish fair price shops with the collaboration of the private sector. It has also decided to introduce a system to levy concessionary electricity tariffs from all state and private trade institutions which take part in supply, transport and sales of commodities under the program. The institutions will also receive special income tax concessions. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Ranil Singh engaged in an inspection tour of the Thomas Dilaru Institute in Biagama today. Me. In a few months, our passports will be printed at this press. We will be embedding microchip technology into these passports. The owner's fingerprint and the photograph will be among the information that will be integrated with microchip technology. That's the development here. After the Sri Lanka government hands over the production of passports to this printing press, in the future, this will also be able to facilitate other countries to print their passports here. As the government, our aim is not only to bring in foreign investments, but also to increase the competitiveness of existing businesses in the country and bring them to the export sector. Parliamentarian Bandula Gunawardana points out that the abolishment of the Act on Price Control makes it impossible to set a controlled price for coconuts. MP Gunawardana made the remark during a media briefing convened by the Economic Research Unit of the Joint Opposition today, adding that coconuts have seen a sharp price rise recently, with it even breaching 100 rupees. <laughs> They have given a solution for the issue of scarcity of coconuts by permitting the importation of coconut kernel. Aren't they ashamed to announce that the solution for the coconut scarcity is to import coconut kernels? Neither the cabinet nor the government has the power to control the price of any goods in Sri Lanka. The reason for that is the government's abolishment of the Price Control Act. If there is no Price Control Act or a Department of Price Control, the only thing that can be done is to impose a maximum retail price. They could issue a Gazette notification for that. The maximum retail price of a coconut can't be imposed. With Mahinda coming into power, a coconut never cost 100 rupees. We challenge the government to try and arrest these helpless traders after controlling the price of coconut through a gazette.
පුළුවන් නම් අතරම් ඌට අරන් පෙන්වන්න කියලා අපි රජයට අභියෝග කරනවා Minister of Sustainable Development and Wildlife Gamini Jayavikrama Pereira claims that a reward of 500,000 rupees await for anyone with information on any elephant or a, an elephant calf recently taken after killing its mother. He divulged the matter while addressing media in Kurunagala yesterday. Unlike before, four tuskers are killed around Kurunagala. None of them had a natural death. CID is conducting an investigation. The issue was taken up in the cabinet meeting and Minister Sagala said clues continue to be received. We have gone to Interpol while finding out information locally. It's the superintendent of police who is conducting investigations irrespective of whoever might be involved, be it politicians, clergy or the public. <laughs> Investigations are clearly being carried out. I don't even ask about the progress. They are given the power and they're doing it. We're looking for the calf of the cow elephant which was killed yesterday in Tirupani. We even looked in the herd with the help of the STF. I'm ready to give 500,000 rupees to anyone who finds this elephant calf. We want to find who did this. The Attorney General's department and my officials are carrying out discussions to tighten the laws at the Wildlife Department. We're going to change the law and we will make this offence as dire as murder. They won't even have bail in the Supreme Court and the fines will be heavy. President Maitipala Sirisena today paid his last respects to former secretary to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Karna Tilaka Amunagama, at a funeral parlour in Borella. Karna Tilaka Amunagama passed away at the age of 63 last evening and family sources confirmed that the cremation will take place tomorrow. Amunagama, a veteran diplomat, served as Sri Lanka's ambassador to Germany, Japan, Thailand and China. He also served as the secretary to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs during the period from 2011 to 2014 before serving as a secretary to the Ministry of Investment Promotions. Here's a look at other stories making news from across the country. Another group of railway trade unions launched a strike this morning. The trade union action was launched by the Railway Technological Management Assistant Officers Association with the participation of several trade unions which were not part of the recent strike. The Sirimao Bandarnaika Children's Hospital in Peradenia is faced with a dearth of doctors. It is reported that currently one doctor is tending to around 75 children per day at the orthopaedic unit. Director General of the hospital, Dr. D. R. K. Herat, stated that although they requested assistance from the Ministry of Health, they have not yet received a response. A collective of several environmental organizations in Sri Lanka held a rally to protest continuing deforestation of the Vilpatu National Park in a bid to raise public awareness this morning. The protest was held at the Vihara Mahadevi Park to urge the government to stop environmental destruction in the Vilpatu National Park. The collective launched a program to collect a million signatures against the deforestation of the Vilpatu National Park. A video released by an Iranian vessel showed the rescue of five Sri Lankan fishermen who were reported missing owing to the inclement weather experienced recently. They were rescued close to the international maritime border of Maldives. You are watching Sri Lanka's award-winning news channel. The Verena 24-7. The Government of Canada welcomes the renewed commitment by the Sri Lankan government in creating transparency, building a corruption-free society and removing barriers to facilitate global trade. High Commissioner of Canada David McKinnon made the acknowledgement at an event held in Colombo yesterday while also hailing the blue-green budget as a positive investor-friendly move. The 14th National Business Excellence Awards 2017 was held in Colombo under the auspices of the High Commissioner of Canada, David McKinnon. The event was organised by the National Chamber of Commerce of Sri Lanka. Lanka IOC PLC clinched the overall gold award, while it also clinched awards under the categories of extra-large and trading. 
The overall silver and large category awards was awarded to Alumex PLC, while the bronze was awarded to Kalani Valley Plantations PLC. Speaking at the award ceremony, Canada's High Commissioner said that Canadian companies with Sri Lankan partners account for half a billion US dollars in trade and is growing rapidly. All the while, a lot of other Canadian companies are coming here to pursue opportunities in IT and infrastructure, clean technology and aviation. And the High Commission is here to do what it can to facilitate those connections. If you like an exporter's interest in Canada, there's a Canadian government-funded organization called the Trade Facilitation Office who's been doing just that. We like an exporter's helping to fund markets in Canada. The High Commissioner also commented on the blue-green budget. These are certainly things that are very much a priority for Canada. The challenge on, on, on all these policies, of course, is in the execution, and we hope Canadians can be a part of that. We'd like his long-term economic growth and its success in finding sustainable peace and reconciliation will depend heavily on the ability of its private sector to expand and develop different sectors of the economy, providing opportunities for all. We see a renewed commitment by the government of Sri Lanka to engage around the world, and we encourage by efforts to take such steps to create a more transparent environment, build a corruption-free society, and to remove unnecessary barriers to trade. Sri Lanka's geographic position, natural resources, and educated population make it, from our perspective, its destination. These are all great incentives for Canadian companies to consider trade and investment. At the Colombo Bulls, Sri Lankan shares closed with little change today. However, near their lowest close in eight months hit in the previous session as gains in plantation and beverage stocks offset falls in palm oil and diversified shares. The all share price index uh, ended 0.07% higher at 6,357.04. It had posted its lowest close since 17th of April yesterday. Daily market turnover was 1.2 billion rupees its highest since the 23rd of November and more than this year's daily average of 941.1 million rupees. Here's Imeshu Fernando from the Colombo Stock Exchange. The market capitalization at the end of the day was 2,894.4 billion rupees. Today's foreign purchases were 467.36 million rupees and foreign sales were 800.3 million rupees. There were two crossings today and the crossing turnover was 222.5 million rupees. And the Sri Lankan rupee closed firmer today as late exported dollar sales outpaced imported demand for the U.S. currency. The spot rupee, which traded at 153 rupees and 50 cents per dollar during the day, ended at 153 rupees and 10 cents to 20 cents per dollar against yesterday's close of 153 rupees and 25 cents to 35 cents. Here's a look at other story, other uh, Sri Lankan, how the Sri Lankan rupee traded against other major currencies. Number one news channel, other than a 24 7. Leaders of 57 Muslim nations have called on the world to recognize the state of Palestine and East Jerusalem as its occupied capital. An organization of Islamic Cooperation Communique declares U.S. President Donald Trump's decision to recognize the city as Israel's capital as null and void. The summit of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation aims to reach a consensus on the Jerusalem dispute among all Islamic countries. The summit's host, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, made the statement in a strong show of support to Palestine. I hope those countries that haven't recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Palestine could admit it now. Today we announce that East Jerusalem is the capital of Palestine. The summit's host, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, made the statement in a strong show of support to Palestine. 
Addressing a media briefing after the summit, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas meanwhile said his country would reject the role of the United States as a mediator if it continues to side with Israel. The United States is no more an honest broker of peace. As Palestinians, Arabics, Muslims, we cannot accept any more the United States as a peace broker because the basic requirements of being a peace broker are to be honest and objective. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu meanwhile rejected the declaration by the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. It would be the best for the Palestinians to recognize reality and act for the sake of peace and not for the sake of extremism. The truth will be out and many countries will yet recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and move their embassies. British Prime Minister Theresa May's government was defeated yesterday when lawmakers forced through changes to its Brexit blueprint. British ministers said these changes could endanger Britain's departure from the European Union. In a blow to British Prime Minister Theresa May, who was already weakened politically after losing her Conservative Party's majority in a June election, the 650-seat parliament voted 309 to 305 in favour of an amendment to hand lawmakers more say over a final exit deal with the EU. Up until the last minute, May's team tried to convince lawmakers in her party to give up their demands and side with the government. Meanwhile, May is to encourage the other 27 leaders during the EU summit, which started today, to approve a move to the second phase of Brexit talks and begin a discussion about future trade. Former Facebook vice president for user growth, Shamat Paliapitiya, recently criticized the very same social network for ripping society apart. Speaking at an event run by the Stanford Graduate School of Business, he described feeling tremendous guilt in helping the company attract 2 billion users. With thousands responding to his remarks following coverage of the event, Paliapitiya reiterated the negative impact of the social media network in an interview with the CNBC Media Network. So what I said was, I think the tools that have been created today are starting to erode the social fabric of how society works. Today we live in a world now where it is easy to confuse truth and popularity. And you can use money to amplify whatever you believe and get people to believe that what is popular is now truthful. What all of these systems do, every single one, is it exploits our own natural tendencies in human beings to get and want feedback. And that feedback, chemically speaking, is the release of dopamine in your brain. And so what these feedback loops do, and they exist everywhere, in Call of Duty, in other video games, in social networking sites, they get you to react. And I think that if you get too desensitized and you need it over and over and over again, then you become actually detached from the world in which you live. You become callous, you become crude. And you're you live in front of your screen. But Look, I think in the case of Facebook specifically, I think they have probably done more than any other company, quite honestly, to try to fix it because of all of the companies, and I've seen them all up close. We allow ourselves to get interacted with in ways where we don't necessarily control the medium or the messenger. You are watching. Sri Lanka's premier news channel, Other Verna 24 7. Highlight. In sports, Sri Lanka's champion motor racer Dilantha Malagama, who secured third place at the Lamborghini Super Trophy World Finals this year, says his target is winning the championship next year. Addressing a media briefing in Colombo yesterday, he revealed his plans for the coming year. Tamarello for the first time, Yuki Hirata goes second. defense, Konopka is still fifth, Weimar is in sixth, third is Mantovani, fourth is Dimas, fifth Konopka. We are competing with a team of richest persons in the world. As a Sri Lankan, I'm happy that I was able to bring Sri Lanka's name among those mighties. Compared to other countries, all the good and humble people are in Sri Lanka. I am sure no one will argue on that. I was thinking a lot how to proceed with this journey with my own people. All our races are funded by you. I mean, we generated funds by selling Delango racing t-shirts, caps and wristwatches. We also donate 10% of our income to the Little Hearts Project. 
I think we will be able to reach the expectations of the Little Hearts project as well as the racing life with Dilantamalagamur. I believe motor racing is a prospective event which could deliver a World Cup to Sri Lanka. I hope to win all three GT Series championships as well as the World Championship next year. Also in sports, England had their best day of the tour yet today on the opening day of the third Ashes Test in Perth. The, the, the visitors, who are 2 nil down in the five-match series, won the toss and went on to amass 305 for the loss of four wickets at stumps. England must avoid defeat in the match, have any hope of retaining the urn. You are watching Sri Lanka's award-winning news channel, Other Verena 24-7. Good evening and welcome to Forecast First. Now you can see temperatures that vary between 20 and 28 degrees Celsius over the course of the day. There will be a formation of a low pressure zone, particularly in the eastern, southern and western part of the country, moving towards the northern region of the island. Now this could bring about some thunder showers or some cloudy weather in the northern region, but as you can see, Jaffna is expected to have some sunny skies over the course of the day. Moving downwards, there will be some sunny weather in the Candy area, but then there will be some thunder showers in Colombo and Gaul. That is it for your weather centre tonight. Let's now take a quick look at your city by city forecast. When you have the time, do connect with us on Facebook by logging on to facebook.com slash first at nine or follow us on Twitter at twitter.com first at nine. As usual, before we go, let us take you to Nigambo, where a vibrant city on the west coast of Sri Lanka known for its centuries-old fishing industry. One of Sri Lanka's major tourist destinations, Nigambo is a multi-religious city with a predominantly Catholic population, giving it the epithet Little Rome. Bringing you the news and information 24 hours a day. This is Sri Lanka's premier news channel. Other Verena, 24-7.